thanks very much indeed, colleagues. Uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, we wish to welcome our colleagues to our grand finale uh, webinar for this year, 2021, under the uh, National Safe Motherhood Experts Committee uh, Safe Motherhood webinar series. And uh, we are more than delighted to have uh, within our midst uh, very senior colleagues in the uh, space of obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, Professor Nett, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for sparing uh, time uh, within your very tight schedule to come and uh, share with the country uh, 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 the incredible work that uh, has been done within the preeclampsia uh, 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 subcommittee of, of, of NASMIC and, and other colleagues as well and clinicians. Uh, we know you all have very tight schedules, but being able to join in here, it's very, very uh, phenomenal. Uh, colleagues who are listening in, we have so far 151 uh, and uh, the numbers are still climbing quite rapidly. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Preeclampsia, eclampsia is one of the challenging uh, conditions uh, to manage uh, 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 in pregnancy. And uh, we think by at the end of this uh, webinar, we will have demystified and uh, tried to make it easy. Uh, for a number of clinicians that may be confronted with uh, some of these cases, uh, mothers with eclampsia, mothers with eclampsia, and other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So we will have uh, presentations. Our moderator, who will, uh, I will hand over to Dr. Irene Chebeti, uh, the OBSGYN uh, from uh, Soreto General Referral Hospital. We will have uh, a presentation from uh, Professor Nate uh, Nashimuli, uh, uh, and then uh, Dr. Moses Adroma, and Dr. Henry uh, Mark Lugove, uh, Sister uh, Sophia uh, uh, Tagea, and Dr. Jacqueline Akello. At this point in time, without any further ado, I want to hand over to Dr. Irene to take our webinar uh, forward. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Over to you, Dr. Irene. Thank you so much, Mr. Richard Kajimu. Colleagues, you're almost welcome to the webinar series like you've had. Preeclampsia so far is the second leading cause of maternal death countrywide. So I think it's coming timely that we get the new updates and we get a way forward of how to reduce these mothers from dying. Like they have said, my name is Dr. Irene Chebet. I'm working in Sorot Regional Referral as Medical Officer Special Grade Ops and Gain. So it's exactly 2 p.m. And according to our agenda, the first presenter is my teacher, Professor Annette Nachimuli who is also a Dean of School for Medicine, College of Health Science, and also the President of East Central and Southern African Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Thank you so much, Annette, for the fight you've done in reducing the cases of preeclampsia and eclampsia in this country. Colleagues, I think at this juncture, I don't know, we may not say a prayer, but maybe we go straight to invite Dr. Professor Annette Nachimuli to say, her presentation and perhaps, I don't know what the, the my team members or my panelists require, whether after each presentation we have some questions and answers or we have two people to present and questions and answers. Yes, Professor, I'm here. Yes, thank you. I'd like to suggest that we have the questions at the end because some may be preempting the other coming presentations but also to make us have time really to comprehensively discuss any issue which would not have been addressed by the end of the, our thank webinar. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Professor. I think that's a good idea. Prof, before you come in, um, I just want to recognize the presence of the uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Reproductive and Infant Health, Dr. Victor Mugahi. Dr. Richard, do you want to say a word or two before we dive in uh, so that even though you drop off, uh, you've uh, opened up on behalf of MOH? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I had actually mentioned that that I listened in to JP's introduction. He, he welcomed all of us to the meeting. I just want to add on his voice and, uh, and uh, really uh, thank Nazmek and the team uh, from the Preeclampsia Eclampsia Subcommittee for putting it together and, and making sure that we have a very wonderful end to the year in terms of disseminating knowledge. We are all looking forward. Professor Nachimuli and all the other panelists, uh, Chair uh, Dr. Irene Chebet, 
thank you so much on behalf of the Minister of Health. Um, I'll be attend this, I'm attending in the background and uh, I'll be happy to, to participate actively. Thank you so much and I wish we go ahead in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Richard Mukahi. So I think now we go straight to the presentation by Professor Annette Nachimuli. And for her, she's presenting uh, about the results of the 2021 nationwide assessment of the management of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Annette. Yeah. Thank you, Irene. I request that I'm allowed to share my presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Good afternoon. In, it's my great pleasure to give you an update on the national-wide assessment of the management of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. This is a survey we've conducted this year uh, with support from UNICEF and the Ministry of Health of, of Uganda. As been introduced, I'm Annette Nachimuli, the Dean School of Medicine here at Makerere, and uh, also the president of Exacog, which is the East Central and Southern African College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So I'm making this presentation on behalf of the NASMEC subcommittee, preeclampsia subcommittee, which is really a committee of members across the country. And this is really the, the, the great pleasure of working with diverse groups all over the country to address a common problem. So as a way of background, I will not really go so much into detail what preeclampsia is, but I just wanted all of us to know, or those who don't know, that preeclampsia is a pregnancy complication, which is characterized mainly by an increase in blood pressure. Uh, this condition is fatal because it causes damage to all organs in the body, but mainly the liver, the kidneys, brain, and the blood coagulation system. And what also makes it a very important problem is that it occurs frequently in pregnancy, but can also occur after delivery and affects both the mother and the baby. And therefore it is, has a high mortality to both mother and baby. So this preeclampsia, uh, uh, globally it affects about five to eight, eight percent of pregnancies. And this is a big number. For example, in Uganda, a year we have about 1.5 million pregnancies. So you imagine five to 8% of these being affected by this condition. And the population in Sub-Saharan Africa have experienced a surge in these disorders of pregnancy, these hypertensive disorders over the past two decades. There are several reasons which are being advanced for this, uh, but partly we know that there are many risk factors for the disease that are now prevalent uh, in our society, which were not there before. Uh, like, for example, mothers are having babies at a later age. There's increased obesity. There are many women who conceive when they already have the chronic hypertension, to mention but a few. So this preeclampsia remains a leading cause of matal maternal mortality and morbidity, uh, particularly in Southern Africa. And in Uganda, it is second leading cause of maternal mortality. According to the just recently released uh, maternal and prenatal death uh, surveillance report. It contributes 15% to the maternal death, coming next to PPH, which is 42%. But we also know that some of the causes of, of death uh, that are referred to as PPH, some actually start as preeclampsia, but usually they'll be recorded as such. But we also know that in the big referral units, the regional referral and national referral hospitals, actually preeclampsia is now leading. Uh, as a cause of maternal mortality, uh, well, uh, getting ahead of uh, hemorrhage. The cause of this is a lot of mobility I'm talking in newborns uh, is because of stillbirth, preterm birth, and early neonatal death. So, in addition to the mothers dying, there are a lot of bad newborn outcomes. Uh, almost a quarter of the newborns we see who have. Uh, preeclampsia end up with one of these, and therefore it, its effects are much worse than even with the mothers. But also what we know is that many survivors end up with long-term complications. Uh, so the disease does not just end at the time of delivery and immediately after. People end up with chronic, uh, can develop chronic kidney disease, renal disease, heart disease, 
even a few years later, even if their blood pressure normalized immediately after delivery. So why did we have this needs assessment carried out? As we, many of us know who are especially in practice, preeclampsia has no cure except that you need to deliver the baby and some people add the placenta. So that is the ultimate cure. But what we know is that early diagnosis and appropriate interventions mitigate the complications and improve outcomes. So it is important to diagnose the disease early and be able to intervene early. There is, however, scarcity of credible national data on the incidence and management practices of hypertensive disorders in Sub-Saharan Africa, which makes it a challenge to craft and effectively monitor ev evidence-based interventions. Therefore, more efforts are required to ensure that we have necessary data to inform development of evidence-based targeted interventions to reduce these hypertensive disorders and other leading causes of maternal and perinatal mortality. Therefore, the aim of this survey was to establish evidence through an assessment of the management of preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders in selected public and private facilities in Uganda. And then we hope that we we'll propose recommendations to the Ministry of Health and other partners, which would inform, give the evidence, use the evidence gathered to, to develop appropriate interventions. This survey, uh, was done countrywide. It constituted uh, 15 regional teams. To, we had to constitute 15 regional teams to collect this data. And each team had at least an obstetrician, a medical officer, a midwife. And we know many times also we had an anesthetic uh, uh, card. We used a tool which was adopted from the WHO preeclampsia quality improvement tool. And at the end of the survey, we assessed 75 facilities. Two of these were the national referral hospitals, and this, I mean, which have to do with maternal and newborn care, Kawempe and Mulago Women's Hospital. We had 14 regional referral hospitals. We had 30 general hospitals. And this is where we included all the private not-for-profit facilities. We included them in the category of general hospitals. We did 14 health center fours and 15 health center threes. The general hospitals, the PNFPs, and health center fours and threes selected were within the catchment area of the regional referral and national referral hospitals. So we couldn't do all the facilities, but we purposely selected those which really fed into these regional referral and national referral hospitals. And we carried out the assessment, focusing mainly on aspects of management of preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This needs assessment focused on the following aspects of the management of preeclampsia and eclampsia. The antenatal care, how prevention was being done, diagnosis, including classification of preeclampsia, management of hypertensive disorders as outpatient and inpatient care. We looked at timely referral to appropriate facilities, the intrapartum and postpartum care, capacity to offer anesthesia for cesarean section when indicated. And we also looked at short, intermediate, and long-term follow-up of preeclamptic mothers. We used an assessment score, uh, and this was calculated as a percentage, and the grading was, as you see, if a, a facility scored 100, that was very good, 80 to 99, good, as you see, and very poor was where the facility scored zero on that assessment tool. And these are the findings. This graph just uh, shows that we, these are the facilities, the health facilities that were assessed. Again, to reiterate that the majority, 40%, were the general hospitals. And this is where also the private not-for-profit. And then we also had good representation from health center three, four, uh, and all the regional referral hospitals and the two national referral hospitals. And according to ownership, 76% uh, of these were public facilities and 24% were uh, private, not for profit. So in summary, how this facility is scored, uh, uh, generally this was using the tool looking at the facility in its entirety. Uh, for, I'll just 
if you focus on what I have highlighted in blue, uh, in terms of ownership and uh, public to private, uh, of course, the PNFs uh, scored higher, 76%, then the public, 56 taken together. And the facility types, uh, we saw that the, the scoring was improving as you go up from health center three, four, from starting with 41% in health center threes, going up to 52 in health center four, 70% in general hospitals and regional referrals at 73. Surprisingly, then it fell as we assess the national referral hospitals. The trend in the other facilities, except the national referral is not surprising because we know that that tool, uh, the aspects it was capturing, which are not really expected to be done in health center threes. So really the trend was expected going up, up to the national, uh, at the regional referral. We were only surprised by the national referrals. But all in all, the overall score was uh, 64%, which is good uh, by our score, but we could say that we could still do a lot more to make it better. So the other aspects we assessed was the availability of health facility, resources and organization for management of preeclampsia and eclampsia. What I've highlighted in orange is just to emphasize that this was an area which we really felt uh, with the performance uh, was really lacking and we need to focus on some of those things, especially when, as we talk about the guidelines, you will see they, they have been addressed there, but also it is somehow a low hanging fruit, things we are able to do and improve. So, Orange really means not good enough, a blue fair and green good as I'll go and presenting the other results. So in summary, uh, up-to-date protocols, finding the up-to-date clinical protocols on the management of preeclampsia available in the natal clinic. Overall, this was in 48% of facilities and it was uh, more in the public facilities, 49.1% and 44.4% in the, uh, the private, which is a bit surprising, but generally we cannot say 48 is good. That was not good enough. So there's very little in terms of uh, uh, update of clinical protocols in our antenatal clinics. The other aspects we looked at was up-to-date clinical protocols being found in the labor wards and postnatal areas. Uh, that score was 50, was 69%, uh, much better than for the outpatient clinics, but we could still do better. Uh, in terms of sufficient supplies of oral and intravenous and hypertensives, uh, what we, we, we saw was that 50, 77% uh, of these drugs were available in the antenatal labor ward and childbirth areas of the maternity in the facilities assessed, which is good. Uh, a kit being available ready for eclampsia and staff skill to use it 24 7, as the language is these days, meaning that at any one time one gets an eclamptic, they're able to handle the emergency. We saw that 68.8% percent of the facilities had this kit, which was also very good. Then healthcare staff in the maternity unit receiving bedside training and regular refresher sessions in the use of max sulfate. We found that, that this was happening in, in just 54.7% of the facilities. Overall, the availability of health facility resources and organizational management of preeclampsia was being done properly in 67% of the facilities. This is a continuation of that other table. And just again to emphasize that when we looked at whether healthcare staff in the antenatal maternity unit conduct regular health education sessions to pregnant women on these conditions, we found that this was happening in 64% of facilities but surprisingly, it was not happening in any of the national referral hospitals. And when we looked at patient right, whether patients' rights are respected, this is green because actually we were kind of surprised that this was good, 86.7%. We find that 
the assessment we carried out showed that 86.7% of facilities, patient rights were being respected. And this is in terms of access to care, information, emotional support, women-centered care, dignity and respect, privacy, companionships. But we also realized that this high score was because usually in the facilities, pre clamps share patients have special rooms. They are kind of isolated from the rest of, they have more privacy, they have more special care in most of the facilities that we assessed, which could have contributed to this high score uh, in terms of patient rights uh, and respect. Because this is different from what we do when we assess all the other facilities generally. This is just to show some of the proof we saw as we assessed that these things existed. These are the kits in Kawempe Hospital, uh, ready to manage the patients, and also Kawala Health Center 4 had its preeclampsia kit ready. The other issue we looked at was whether interventions are in place of proven effectiveness to prevent preeclampsia. We know now there is a lot of evidence to show that there are some interventions which are helpful in preventing uh, preeclampsia or delaying its onset, especially in women who are considered high risk. And some of these are what we highlight here. Calcium supplementation. We checked whether calcium supplementation during pregnancy is being given to all women, but especially those at high risk of preeclampsia. We found that this was only happening in 18% of facilities and which was considered poor. So this is not happening. Low dose aspirin, whether it is being given to women at risk, again, we found that this was only happening in 19% of facilities, which is very poor. And then strict bed rest being not recommended. We are told that we should not recommend strict bed rest to women with preeclampsia, as it has been shown to be actually counterproductive and anything a dangerous practice, but we found that this was being uh, done in 54% of facilities. So there's still almost another equal number of facilities still letting patients go on strict bed rest, which is not good. In the terms of whether they use diuretics uh, to prevent uh, preeclampsia and this complication, we found that 68.7% uh, of facilities don't use it, which was very good. Uh, overall, we found that use of these interventions of proven effectiveness was only happening in 38% of facilities. So these are really major gaps that we hope to address as we move in the future. The other issue we looked at, the appropriateness of diagnosis and management of mild preeclampsia, management of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. And the parameters we looked at were management of mild preeclampsia, whether management of, of mild PET is appropriate. We found that women with mild PET were followed up as outpatient twice a week, whether they were followed up twice a week, which is the recommendation. This was only happening in 29.5% of facilities, and that is poor. Uh, the other parameter we looked at was whether when women have mild preeclampsia at term, induction of labor is recommended. We found that this was only happening in 26% of cases of, of the facilities, which was also very low. And moreover, when we know that preeclampsia, in order to be managed, the ultimate cure is delivery. So that is probably contributing to the high morbidities and mortalities we are having. Then we also looked at whether management of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia is appropriate. One of the parameters is following an eclamptic convulsion. Birth of the baby is conducted within 12 hours of onset of the convulsion. We were happy to see that 72% of facilities were doing this, but again, worried that it was only half of the national referral, which means one of them, this is not really being happening. And then whether if diagnosis of severe preeclampsia is confirmed, loading dose of magnesium sulfate and antihypertensives and immediate transfer to a referral of where it is applicable is, is happening. We found that this is happening in 85% of facilities, which was also very good. And we also looked at if diagnosis of severe preeclampsia is confirmed, magnesium sulfate is administered uh, 
full IV or IM regimen and continued at least 24 hours after birth or the last seizure, we found that this was happening at 67% of the facilities. Now, this is low considering that we know how important magnesium sulfate is as a drug, though it is scoring in the good range. So generally speaking, we found that uh, the other parameters, uh, like whether management of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia is appropriate, we looked at systolic blood pressure when it is 160 or more, and then systolic when it's 110 or higher, whether antihypertensives are given, we found this was happening in 78.7% .7 of facilities. This is fair, but we would really be aiming for 100%, again, knowing how important these drugs are. Then whether vital signs, which is blood pressure, pulse, respiration rate, reflexes, heart, fetal heart, are regularly monitored, and the woman is never left alone, we found that this was happening in only 54% of facilities. Then whether a strict fluid balance chart, which means monitoring the amount of fluid administered and urine output is maintained. It was only happening in 22.9% of facilities, very low figure. Whether calcium gluconate is readily available to counteract the effect of magnesium sulfate. We found that this was in 82% of facilities and we could say Though very good, it's not good enough because magnesium sulfate and calcium gluconate should be fully available all the time if we are to combat this terrible disease. Then what did surprise us was the issue of whether laboratory investigations like complete blood count, liver, renal function tests are done to assess disease progression. This was happening in 49% of facilities. We saw that this was a big challenge and yet it is very important in the diagnosis and also follow-up of women with preeclampsia. So overall, the appropriateness of diagnosis and management of preeclampsia was only appropriate in 56% of facilities. The other thing we looked at was that whether decisions regarding timing and mode of birth are in line with current recommendations. These recommendations are what we looked at here. Induction of labor is recommended for women with severe PET at gestational age when the fetus is not yet viable. Our viability, we took it at 28 weeks of gestation, uh, which is really in our setting, but we know also just before, maybe two weeks before. But we found that this was happening in 72%, which is good, but would be better. And whether women with severe PETs before 34 weeks, uh, but after viability, a policy of expectant management was being recommended, provided that there is, and there is no uncontrolled maternal hypertension and other organ dysfunction. We found that it was happening in 77% of the facilities, which was also good. In women with severe preeclampsia, whether a, uh, with a viable fetus and between 34 and 36, we ask whether the, the policy of expectant management may be used, provided that uncontrolled maternal hypertension, increased organ dysfunction uh, are not compromised. We found that this was also fair, happening in 60% of the facilities. So overall, we would say that the decisions regarding timing and mode of birth were in line with the current recommendation in 80% of the facilities, which is very good. Again, continuing with those same decisions, I will quickly go through them. We found that in women with severe PET at term, we are expected to deliver them within 24 hours. This was happening in 85% of facilities. Whether facilities were able to offer spinal anesthesia in the case of a cesarean section, we saw that this was good. It was, could happen in 96% of uh, facilities. Maybe I would like to, to say, point out something here that most of these further assessments, we carried them from out in health center falls up to the regional referrals because it was not really applicable to the health center threes. So they were left out of this analysis. 
The facility is, whether the facility is able to offer general anesthesia when it is needed, we saw that this was yes for 91% of the facilities, which was also very good. We also looked at whether women diagnosed with preeclampsia are correctly managed in the postpartum period, uh, discharge and follow-up. We looked at whether women are carefully monitored after birth, and we saw that this was only happening in 64% of the facilities. And actually, uh, when we review this maternal death, we see that a lot of women are dying when during that period after birth when they have not been monitored. And then in women who, we treated with, who are treated with antihypertensives, we asked whether we checked whether there is continued antihypertensive treatment postpartum. And we saw that this actually was good coverage. It was 86.9%. And whether women with severe postpartum hypertension are treated with antihypertensive medicines, we saw that this was happening in 88% of facilities. And when it came to discharge and follow-up, we, we, we assessed whether women given discharge, are given discharge instructions, including education on signs and symptoms of severe preeclampsia and uh, given information to seek care immediately if they occur and the dates for postnatal contacts. We were sadly uh, saw that this was only happening in 42%. So women after doing, taking very good care of them, go, go home and the follow-up is really not good, only happening in 42% of facilities. Women, whether women are discharged at follow-up are given education on the long-term complications of preeclampsia, this was only happening in 26% of the facilities. So women are not told about the dangers they will have in the future as a result of having suffered from preeclampsia, a big gap. So generally speaking, the major challenges we identified in the management of preeclampsia and eclampsia was that there were lack of protocols at the different service points, that is that natal care, the labor and postnatal wards, there were many improvised handwritten documents on magnesium administration, and many of these were inconsistent with WHO and Ministry of Health guidelines. We also found that national guidelines were silent on the antenatal care postpartum follow-up beyond six weeks. There was, inadequate comp there was inadequate knowledge, which was compounded by absence of in-service and bedside training or refresher drills to healthcare workers. There was inadequate lab services in public health facilities, making classification and management of preeclampsia difficult. There was non-functionality of some health center for as comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care facilities, because these are expected to handle the, those services, but many were not functional to that level. There were, there were issues that pointed to unnecessary referrals due to absenteeism of qualified human resource. So there are things which could be done at lower facilities, but patients had to endure referrals because human resource was not on the ground. And then we saw that there was inadequate uh, tools for monitoring, uh, uh, especially the lab supplies. So in terms of next steps, uh, we are going on to, we continue to disseminate these findings to the Ministry of Health and other st stakeholders. And I'm happy that everybody here is a stakeholder. Uh, and this is ongoing. Uh, we have participated in updating the national protocols and guidelines of preeclampsia. And today you're going to hear about these updates from my other colleagues who are presenting. We have strengthened and maintained re these regional preeclampsia team leaders, some of whom are presenting here and others I'm sure on this team. These are doctors, midwives who have become champions of preeclampsia. We are maintaining contact with them so that we are able to help each other to address this big challenge. Mentorship is ongoing on these new guidelines. We are also out, mapping out regional implementation of partners that can help us plug the gaps we've identified. Uh, we are developing a preeclampsia interventional framework with key activities that will help us respond to the gaps that we have identified in this needs assessment. But the ultimate goal is to address the preventable maternal and perinatal mortality and morbidity due preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders 
through e implementing the interventional framework that we are currently developing. So thank you for listening to me, but I have a lot of people I want to acknowledge, those who have supported and funded this survey and other preeclampsia work, UNICEF, WHO, Ministry of Health, Makere University, Mulago Women's Hospital, Kawempe National Referral Hospital, uh, the NASMEC subcommittee members, the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Uganda, ExaCOG members, the Uganda Private Midwives, and all the regional preeclampsia teams. All these have done a great deal as we were doing this survey. Uh, thank you, and it's my great pleasure that you have listened to me. Thank you so much, Professor Nachimuli, for being very clear, eloquent, and precise. Colleagues, you're most welcome. The participants have increased. We are at 400. I see questions are coming on. But we earlier on agreed that all the, all the panelists present, then we keep picking our questions and write them aside. Then later on, we shall brainstorm with questions and answer them. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, at this juncture, if we agree, we move to the second presenter, who, who is going to take us through the new Ministry of Health guidelines for management of preeclampsia, and that is Dr. Moses Adroma of Makere University. Thank you, Moses. You're welcome to. Uh, thank you so much, moderator. Uh, can the uh, host give me a right to share the slides? Okay. Thank you so much, Professor, for that eloquent presentation that uh, eventually leads to my presentation. So my name is Moses. I work with the uh, Makere University, and I'm going to present this on behalf of the Preclamsia Subcommittee of the NASMIC. So we'll be looking at the, the new guideline that we have uh, developed, but uh, before that, we'll just briefly look at the different uh, types of uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, uh, just briefly look at how we can make a diagnosis of each. And then after the guideline, we'll be looking at uh, how we can do risk reduction or prevention of preeclampsia among these women who are at risk. So the, the major hypertensive disorders in pregnancy are chronic hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia and eclampsia, which are sometimes taken as a single entity. Uh, we may have preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension and something we call HELP syndrome. So we'll briefly look at what this means. So let's begin with the uh, chronic hypertension or pre-existing hypertension. This is hypertension that is diagnosed before pregnancy or before 20 weeks of gestation, meaning that a woman either conceives knowing that she's hypertensive or she conceives before knowing she's hypertensive, but then the diagnosis is made when she has not reached 20 weeks of uh, gestation. It may also be hypertension that is first diagnosed during pregnancy, irrespective of when it is diagnosed, diagnosed but it persists beyond 12 weeks. So such mothers are also classified to have uh, chronic hypertension. Generally, we make a diagnosis of hypertension when we have uh, a systolic blood pressure of 140 or more, or a diastolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters or more, or both. So you just need eight of them. If you have both of them, well and good, but either works. Now this diagnosis is based if the blood pressure measurements are done at least two on at least two occasions, which should be taken four hours apart. However, in the setting of what we call severe hypertension, that is when the blood pressure is above 160 over 110 millimeters of mercury, you do not need to wait for four hours. That diagnosis can be confirmed in a short interval uh, to facilitate a timely treatment. And we shall look at what this short interval means in our new uh, guideline. Then we have what we call gestational hypertension. Uh, this is new onset of uh, systolic blood pressure of 140 millimeters of mercury or more, or a diastolic of 90 millimeters or more, or both, which, which should be measured at least two occasions, uh, at least four hours apart, after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normotensive individual. So this means that this woman conceives when she's known not to have high blood pressure, uh, however, after 20 weeks, she develops high blood pressure. Now, this mother should not have proteinuria, so no protein in urine, 
or no severe features of preeclampsia. These include the thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, elevated liver enzymes, pulmonary edema, cerebral or visual symptoms. And we shall be looking at what this means in terms of figures. Now we have the notorious uh, preeclampsia. So this is new onset of systolic blood pressure of 140 millimeters of mercury or a diastolic of 90 millimeters of mercury or both, again taken on two occasions or at least two occasions, which should be four hours apart after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normal tensive mother. So this one also develops hypertension after 20 weeks. Or a systolic of 160 or a diastolic of 130 or 110 or more or both. And this will be confirmed within minutes to facilitate uh, timely uh, antihypertensive uh, therapy. And then plus proteinuria. That proteinuria can be measured in terms of uh, uh, the amount in 24 hour urine collection, that's 300 more, uh, at least 300 milligrams, or protein creatinine ratio of 0 0.3 or urine dipstick reading of at least two plus. So depending on whatever you can do. However, we find that measuring 24 hour urine collection protein is a bit cumbersome and may not be clinically feasible. Or in the absence of proteinuria, you may have new onset hypertension plus any of the following which we are going to look at. And this includes thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of less than 100,000 per microliter, Renal insufficient, which is defined as serum creatinine of more than 1.1 milligrams per deciliter or 90 micromoles per liter, or a doubling of serum creatinine in the absence of any other renal disease. So what do we mean by a doubling of serum creatinine? If you, have, if, 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 if you happen to see a mother maybe in early pregnancy with let's say a renal uh, uh, function test that has serum creatinine of 0 0.4, for any other reason, and then after 20 weeks, this mother develops high blood pressure and you do renal function test, the serum creatinine, let's say now is 0 0.8. From 0 0.4, it has now gone to 0 0.8. That mother is considered to have preeclampsia because the physiological changes that happen during pregnancy may mimic, may, may hinder the actual increase in serum creatinine. So the serum creatinine may appear low when actually in reality, it is not, it's not low. So we may also have impaired liver function as indicated by serum creatinine levels. I mean, uh, uh, elevated liver enzymes, uh, which will be at least twice the upper limit of normal for that particular laboratory. We may have uh, pulmonary edema, persistent uh, cerebral or visual symptoms. I just want to uh, emphasize this point of in the absence of proteinuria. Now, this means that you do not necessarily need to have proteinuria present to make a diagnosis of preeclampsia. And we shall see why we say that, because preeclampsia is what we call a multi-system uh, disease. It affects multi multi multiple organs, which Professor said. And these organs are not affected in a particular order. It does not mean that the kidneys are first affected, then proteinuria comes, then liver is damaged, then the brain is damaged, no. So if you have hypertension plus any other evidence of end organ damage, even if you do not have proteinuria, you should be making a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Now preeclampsia at present is uh, classified as preeclampsia with severe features or preeclampsia without severe features. And these features can be symptoms that the patient reports, and we shall be looking at examples of this. There may be physical find, examination findings that weakliness and illicit, or there may be laboratory findings, or there may be imaging findings. So preeclampsia with their severe features. So any of these any of these findings in a patient in a, in a patient with preeclampsia will classify that patient to have preeclampsia with severe features. So you have one blood pressure in the severe range. And we are talking about uh, blood pressures of more than 160 systolic or more than 110 systolic uh, on, on two occasions, at least four hours apart. However, we also say that this should be confirmed immediately so that you're able to start antihypertensive therapy as soon as possible. So therefore you may not necessarily need four hours to make this uh, observation. If a person has impaired liver function, which we already talked about, 
uh, which is uh, indicated by elevated liver enzymes, particularly AST and ALT, which are twice the upper limit of normal, where a person has severe persistent right upper quadrant or epigastric pain that is unresponsive to medication and is not accounted for by any other alternative diagnosis or both of those, then that person qualifies to uh, be called having preeclampsia with severe features. You have progressive renal insufficiency, which we have already explained, serum creatinine of more than 1.1 milligrams per deciliter, or a doubling of serum creatinine concentration in, in, in the absence of any other renal disease. And then thrombocytopenia, which we talked about, pulmonary edema, edema, which can be surrogately picked when you have oxygen saturation of less than 90%. Then if you have persistent cerebral or visual disturbances, such patients all qualify to be classified as having preeclampsia with severe features. Now we may also have uh, what we call chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. This means that the person already had chronic hypertension, it is known, but then develops preeclampsia along the way. And how do we make this diagnosis? Now, a sudden increase in blood pressure that was previously well controlled, or the need to escal escalate or increase antihypertensive therapy to control blood pressure, meaning that you had a patient who is known to have hypertension even before pregnancy. The blood pressures were well controlled, but after 20 weeks, you need to increase uh, the, the, the number of drugs or the doses that she has been using, or the blood pressures all of a sudden become uh, become high when they were already well controlled. Or you may have new onset of proteinuria or a sudden increase in proteinuria in a person with known proteinuria before. What does this mean? The person is known to have chronic hypertension. She didn't have proteinuria. Now she develops proteinuria. So she, that is classified to be a preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. Or if the person already had proteinuria, maybe it was one plus, or maybe it is two plus, but now she has four plus or three plus. That person is considered to have superimposed preeclampsia on chronic hypertension. However, what to note here is that this, the precise diagnosis here is very challenging. The best thing is to have a high clinical suspicion because of the increased risk of maternal and fetal or neonatal risks that are associated with superimposed preeclampsia. Then you have a chronic hypertension with, super, uh, with the severe super, uh, with the superimposed preeclampsia with severe features. So general, all the features of severe disease that we talked about, when they happen, when they are developed by a person who is already known to have chronic hypertension, that person is said to have a chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia with severe uh, features. Now, eclampsia is, in a person with preeclampsia, if, a, if that person develops what we call generalized seizures, that cannot be attributed to any other cause. That person is considered to have eclampsia. Uh, something which we need to know here is that many mothers, although there may not be very many, a, a, number of, a, a number of mothers tend to have normal blood pressures after they have convulsed. Initially, they have uh, a high blood pressure when they convulse the blood pressure has become normal. So we need to be careful to, to note that. Then the last one here is what we call HELP syndrome. Uh, this is the, the presence of hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. And hypertension may be present. When hypertension is present, help, uh, this HELP syndrome is considered as a variant of preeclampsia. But also, we also know that uh, HELP syndrome may occur even when there's no hypertension. Now, just to go into the guideline, there are a few facts of, about preeclampsia that in partly influence the wisdom behind the guideline. Now, number one, preeclampsia is a progressive disease. The mother you are attending to today may not be the same mother tomorrow. She may be worse tomorrow. Then preeclampsia, as we said earlier on, affects multiple uh, organ systems and, and, and in no particular order. And that's what we, one of the reasons why we say proteinuria is not a must because the mother may be, uh, it might be the liver, it may be the brain that is affected. And I think many of you who are practicing might have seen that there are mothers who have high blood pressure and they don't have any, they have normal labs. Or they may have high blood pressure, they convulse, 
But when you look at the liver functions, you look at the, 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 the renal functions, they are pretty normal. So multiple organs are affected. Then the progression from non-severe to severe may be gradual or rapid. This mother you are seeing in the morning, maybe having preeclampsia without severe features, in the evening may turn to be one with severe features and, and even converse. So we looked at all this so that, and try to come up with something that addresses all this. Then the third, the, the, the fourth point which we need to know is that drug therapy does not prevent disease progression. The purpose of giving antihypertensives is not to cure the disease. Even giving magnesium sulfate is not to cure the disease. It is to prevent seizures or to control seizures. Meanwhile, uh, uh, antihypertensives, they are to, pre uh, to prevent severe hypertension and therefore prevent the consequences or the complications of severe hypertension, particularly cardiovascular accidents or stroke. So therefore, giving antihypertensives does not mean that you are stopping the progress of the disease. The disease cannot be stopped by drug therapy. It is only delivered, as Professor said, that uh, or termination of pregnancy that cures preeclampsia. As far as evidence is concerned, that's all we know about for preeclampsia cure for now. Number uh, the second, but not last, is uh, preeclampsia survivors are at increased risk of chronic hypertension, cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety later in their life. So we have tried to produce a guideline that takes care of all this as well. Then the last one here is that offsprings of preeclamptic survivors are at increased risk of hypertension in life. Then they, are, they themselves are also at increased risk of getting preeclampsia in their own life, especially the ladies. And there's also evidence that a man whose, whose mother was, a man who was a product of a, a preeclamptic mother is likely to have his uh, wife also getting preeclampsia. So, these are facts that we try to look at before coming up to the, uh, uh, the, devolved, the, the guideline. So this guideline was developed by a team of experts and we had several meetings that was coordinated by NASMIC, MOH and other partners. And we reviewed several international guidelines. Some of those are the examples and recent literature plus trials as well. So I will look at the flow chart, but not the, the narrative, so I just hope people are able to see. Maybe I can uh, increase the font a bit. So I can proceed from here. So we, we are looking at um, you receiving a mother with uh, high blood pressure. So we say you should suspect or recognize uh, preeclampsia. If you have a mother who presents with a systolic blood pressure of 140, or a diastolic of 90, millim or 90 millimeters of mercury or more, which are taken two readings, at least two readings, four hours apart, plus urine protein of two plus. Or if the blood pressure is uh, 160 over 110, which should be confirmed within 15 minutes. So earlier on, I said uh, we say, it is recommended that you confirm within within minutes, so the minutes were not clearly specified. So we chose to say you should confirm within 15 minutes. And if that mother uh, presents after 20 weeks of gestation. Now, when you have that kind of mother, it depending on uh, what level of facility you are, you need to inform your, your most senior clinician within five minutes. And this can be the clinic officer or the medical officer or the senior house officer or the specialist as soon as five, minutes. Now, your action at that point now depends on what level you are. If you're in a level two or three, which are really BMOC levels, what you need to do for that mother is to give antihypertensive anti therapy and loading dose of magnesium sulfate. We shall see what kind of drugs you give when you look at other boxes. Then you document and refer this mother to a level four, a functional level four facility or hospital. Now, where, when you are at that level four or hospital, if you receive a mother either from a lower unit or the mother comes direct to the hospital, what you need to do is you must admit that mother. So we say all mothers with high blood pressure, 
must be admitted. And why do we admit them? You need to admit these mothers for a comprehensive evaluation. So we need a detailed history, a detailed physical examination, laboratory tests, which, we, which include a complete blood count, liver function test, renal function test, LDH if you're able to, and then ultrasound scan or imaging. Now, that comprehensive assessment combining history, physical exam, labs, and imaging will then help you to determine whether this mother has preeclampsia with severe features or the mother has preeclampsia without severe features. And to, uh, to, to the right of the, to the right of the, the flow chart, any, any one of these features, so we're looking at the preeclampsia with, with, with severe features, any one of these classifies the mother to have preeclampsia with severe features. One, you have blood pressure in severe range, and we already said that it means you have a systolic of 160 or more, or a diastolic of 110 or more. So if the person has severe symptoms, and here we are talking about persistent headache, altered mentation, unconsciousness, persistent epigastric pain, or persistent right upper quadrant pain, visual changes, which may include blur of vision, or scotomata, or photopsia, or sparks, or blindness, or the person has convulsions, or, or, or fits, or scissors, which then classifies the person to have uh, eclampsia, or the person has uh, reduced urine output. If you have pulmonary edema or, a, an, a, or an, a, uh, oxygen saturation of less than 90%, patient has thrombocytopenia of, or with platelet count of less than 100,000 per microliter. You have elevated liver enzymes, that is AST, ALT, which are twice uh, the upper limit of normal or more. You have serum creatine levels, which are the levels that we already discussed. Then you have intrauterine growth restriction, you have disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC, you have absent or reversed umbilical artery Doppler studies, if you are able to do that. Then you have HELP syndrome. We already talked about what HELP syndrome means. This means that this patient has preeclampsia with severe features. Now, if the patient does not have any of these, which is now to the left, of, the, of, the, of that box. So if the person has a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90, but less than 160 over 110, she has no severe symptoms. Her laboratory findings are not in the category of severe disease, and the ultrasound findings are not also in the category of severe disease, then that mother has preeclampsia without severe features. Now, how do we deal with these two? So let's start with the easier one, which is preeclampsia without severe features. And this is the one on the left. So if you have a mother with preeclampsia without severe features, the next question you need to ask yourself is what is the gestational age of this mother? If the mother is 37 weeks or more, that mother should remain admitted and you should start, uh, initiate delivery within 24 hours. Now this, this word initiate, we struggle a lot on which, which word we should put. The others say deliver should be within 24 hours, but then we realize that there are problems that we could pose. So what we mean here by initiate deliver is that within 24 hours, delivery process must be going on. So, and we also see that the mode of delivery should be purely based on obstetric assessment. So meaning that if the mother qualifies to have trial of vaginal delivery, then you start induction. So within 24 hours, induction must be going on. If the mother does not qualify for uh, vaginal delivery, then that mother should be operated within 24 hours. Now, if you have a mother who is less than 37 weeks of gestation, we can manage that mother as an outpatient. Now, as an outpatient, you must be careful also to judge where is this mother coming from. If the mother was referred to you from maybe a lower facility, which is 100 kilometers away, it may not be feasible to say that this mother should be seen as an outpatient. You can say that mother remains admitted and just manage her from there. But if the, the, the feasibility of outpatient management is there, then you manage this person as an outpatient, and this is the component of what that outpatient care 
uh, is. So you should see the patient weekly in the antenatal clinic and at least by a medical officer. So during that assess, during that uh, assess, during that visit, you should assess for development of severe symptoms when we have already talked about what they are. So every time the mother comes, you must assess for development of severe symptoms. You must control blood pressure with an oral nifedipine, nifedopa, or labetalol, or a combination of all those three drugs. And your target blood pressure should be 135 over 85 when the, the mother is still pregnant. And we are very aware that it's very hard to have a single digit uh, blood pressure, say 135 over 85. That's practically impossible. So we say if you can maintain blood pressure between 130 to 139, that is systolic, over 80 to 89, that's good. Then you must have weekly laboratory tests, CBC, LFTs, uh, RFTs. If you are unable to do those tests completely, at least have a platelet count, have AST, have ALT, have, a, uh, have serum creatinine. The purpose of this is we try to look for, is this mother still remain with, uh, with, without severe features or the mother is moving towards a preeclampsia with severe features. Then you should have a weekly obstetric ultrasound scan. Now, you as the clinician who's attending to this mother, it's not just right, do obstetric scan. You should be very clear on what you want. Here we want you to look at fetal growth because we saw IEGR or intrauterine growth restriction is a problem, is one of the features of severe disease. So we want you to look at fetal growth, biophysical profile, non-stress test if you are able to, but if you are not able to, you do what you can. You need to do umbilical artery Doppler studies if you can. Then if the mother is less than 34 weeks of gestation, you should give the mother uh, steroids. And we said betamethasone, since it is given 12 hourly for only one day, is better compared to dexamethasone. However, if you don't have the betamethasone, you should, you should give your dexamethasone, which will be for two days. Then you need to teach the mother about the severe symptoms. On top of the severe symptoms, you teach the mother about fetal movement. So if there is a reduction of fetal movement or the development of severe symptoms, that should bring the mother back to hospital as soon as possible, even if the date of appointment has not reached. So if there are no severe features, you monitor this mother up to 37 weeks and you deliver. If, there's, if severe features develop, you admit the mother and deliver immediately. So that's how we, we should deal with preeclampsia without severe features. Now, if you come to the right side where we are having preeclampsia with severe features, there we have uh, three arrows pointing. So the first arrow points to the first goal of management, and that is to prevent or control convulsions or fever or, or, or seizures or fits. So how do we do this? We need to give the mother a loading dose of magnesium sulfate, and the loading dose is 14 grams, which will be given as four grams of IV of 20%, followed by five grams of 50%, uh, with one mil of 2% lignocaine, and that should be IM in each bottle. Then that is followed by maintenance dose of, of five grams of 50%, again with one mil of 2% lignocaine, in each in alternate buttock every four hours for 24 hours after delivery or the last conversion, whichever occurred first. What does this mean? If you have, if 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 a mother convulses while uh while pregnant, then you are going to count your 24 hours from the time of delivery. If the mother is delivered but then convulses, you are going to start counting your 24 hours from that last conversion. However, every time you are given subsequent dose of magnesium, tox uh, magnesium sulfate, you need to assess for signs of magnesium toxicity. And the first sign that appears when there's magnesium toxicity is hyporeflexia, even before we get respiratory depression. So that means we need to uh, equip our midwives with skills of getting deep tendon reflexes. Then you have a uh, respiratory depression that is determined by a respiratory rate of less than uh, 16 breaths per minute. And as I say, this, is a this comes later, but the first thing that comes is hyporeflexia. 
Now, if you have magnesium uh, toxicity, as we said, as Professor said, we need to have uh, calcium gluconate available all the time. And then if the mother convulses while still uh, receiving magnesium uh, sulfate, you need to give two grams of IV and then continue with maintenance dose of, uh, of, of, of magnesium sulfate. Now, if there, are, if there are signs of renal insufficiency, you may need to reduce the dose to half of what you've been uh, giving. Now, if after the two grams, the mother convulses again, we try to look for what drug we can give, but we opted to say you can give phenytone. However, you need to call your critical care team to be able to manage that patient uh, together. Now, our second goal of management of this mother is to control blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is in severe range, that is a systolic of 160 or diastolic of 110 or more or both, then you need to give IV hydralazine at five milligrams, which should be repeated every 30 minutes until the blood pressure is now within the non-severe range, less than 160 over less than 110. However, you should not exceed 30 milligrams in 24 hours. In the absence of hydrolyzing, you can use IV labetalol, which can be repeated every 10 minutes, and even subsequent doses can be doubled. So if you start at 20, you can uh, double to 40 to 80 until the blood pressure again is also in the non-severe range. And the maximum total dose, which you should not exceed in 24 hours, is 300 milligrams. Now, in the absence of those two drugs, if you have access to what we call oral immediate release nifedipine, which is 10 milligrams, you can actually also control blood pressure from severe range to non-severe range using that drug. So you'll be able to give every 20 minutes at a dose of 10 milligrams until the blood pressure again is 160 or 110 diastolic. Now your target blood pressure Okay, before the target pressure, once you have attained a blood pressure which is in the non severe range, then you can start oral, uh, the, the, the regular oral antihypertensives. That's the regular nifedipine, the, the, the methyl dopa, the labetalol that we talked about under the outpatient care management of those who are without severe features. And your target blood pressure when the mother is still pregnant is 135 over 85. And when you are lower in blood pressure, do not be very aggressive to lower blood pressures within a short period of time, even if you are starting from a severe range. This is because in a layman's language that the brain was used to receiving blood pressures at higher, high level. So when you bring blood pressures down rapidly, you can end up with ischemic uh, stroke. Now, the next one, uh, you can just pull down a bit. The next one. So the third goal is uh, the deliver, which is, uh, I think, the, the most difficult thing for most of us, or the most challenging thing for most of us. Now, when you have, when you have a mother with uh, preeclampsia with severe features, you see there are four arrows pointing from plan for deliver. The first thing, let's look at the one on the left. You need to ask yourself, do I have, or does the mother have, any indication for immediate delivery? or immediate delivery, irrespective of the gestational age, whether the mother is 20 weeks, 25, 30, at term 40. When you have any of this, that means you must deliver the mother immediately. One, you have abnormal neurological features. That means you have intractable headache, that is refractory to treatment. You have repeated visual symptoms. You have eclampsia, you have stroke you have repeated episodes of uh, severe hypertension that you cannot control with three different classes of antihypertensives. You have pulmonary edema, you have progressive worsening of thrombocytopenia, you have lab findings that are in the severe range and they are not improving. You have non-reassuring fetal status, you have uh, oligohydrominous, that is an uh, anamniotic fluid index of, le of less than five or deeper school of less than two centimeters, or the mother is hemodynamically unstable, you have persistent epigastric pain that is unresponsive to analgesia, you have myocardial infarction, 
quadriculopathy, uh, help syndrome, placenta abruptio, preterm labor, preterm prelabor uh, pre, uh, pre rupture of membranes. You have to deliver that mother immediately. Now, the last one there is maternal request for immediate delivery. Even if in your own judgment as a clinician that the mother can pull for some days, if the mother requests for delivery, continue and deliver that mother because you don't know what may happen the following day. You may end up being blamed for delaying delivery when the mother uh, requested. If the mother is 37 weeks and above, that mother should be delivered within 24 hours. If the mother is 34 to 37 weeks of gestation, you can offer expectant management when the person is admitted. If there is no evidence of maternal or fetal compromise. However, for that group, we say that if the mother is between 36 to 37, that's 36 weeks and six days, you need to suggest deliver to the mother and a caretaker. If the mother is 28 to 34 weeks of gestation, we can still offer uh, expectant management, but in hospital, as long as there's no maternal or fetal compromise. Now, when we choose to have uh, expectant management, what is the component? The component is that the person must be admitted in hospital until delivery. You should have daily maternal and fetal assessment for indications for immediate delivery. You must monitor blood pressure at worst every four hours. You should have daily labs the ones we talked about. And for those who are still less than 34 weeks, you need to give them uh, steroids as discussed uh, uh, before. Then you need to control blood pressure with, uh, with nifedipine, methyl dopa, or labetalol, a combination, and the target blood pressure remains the same. Then you need to complete the maintenance dose of magnesium sulfate. You should have daily uh, cardiotocograph. If, if, the, if, if, you, if the facility is available, if not available, you can do uh, the, the regular fetal uh, monitor. Uh, just moved into a part-time care. Uh, Moses, we, we, we are running out of time. I don't know how much time. We want to give okay, you just about in, in, uh, in, uh, two in, minutes uh, to summarize. In, okay, in five minutes, I'll summarize. In part-time care, the focus is the continuous monitoring, if you're able, and control of hypertension. Now, the postpartum care is immediately regular or uh, uh, tight monitoring of blood pressures or vital signs, completion of magnesium sulfate. And then you have to repeat the blood tests at least two times before you can discharge the mother. And that means you should have either two normal sets or two sets that are trending towards normal. Then in the short, in the short and long term, you need to review this mother at one week, every two weeks until six weeks, and then monthly until 12 weeks. And the purpose here is really to identify the, the long-term complications, what, that which we talked earlier on, and then also to, to, assess, uh, uh, to, 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 to assess for those who may be persisting with, uh, uh, with the hypertension. Now, the last thing that we look at is the prevention. And this prevention we are talking about, uh, what professor discussed in the in the in the in the in the, in the survey, and that is uh, uh, the use of aspirin and calcium. So we have mothers who are at high risk, who are at very high risk, and those who are at moderate risk. So if mothers who have a very high risk, when you have when they just have any one of them, you need to give them uh, aspirin, which starts at 11 weeks, and then preferable before 16 weeks, and you stop this aspirin at 36 weeks. Okay, so that is where I end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moses. Yours was really interesting, but it was so detailed. It's like staying for a whole teaching of preeclampsia. Uh, colleagues, time is running out. We've already consumed half of the time we have. We had a portion for this uh, uh, webinar. But then those people, we agreed again, the questions and answers at the end. If you have any question, you quickly drop in the box of question and answer. And then, uh, so therefore, we move to the, sec the third presentation, but I, I requested that we try to summarize since the guidelines will be disseminated later and people will have various CMEs at their units. We now move to the silent features of the new guidelines. What is different from the old guidelines and the new guidelines, which will be taken 
through by Henry Mark, who is also from Makere University. Thank you, Henry, you're welcome. Thank you, Irene. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would have loved to be from Makere, but for now I'm from Bara, but I've worked with folks from Makere, like you've had uh, Prof. Annette and uh, Dr. Moses already. Um, yeah, I think that's the affiliation I have uh, with Makere for now. Um, I'm just trying to make the slide move. Yes, so I have only one slide to share. And um, I compared the new uh, guidelines with the Uganda Clinical Guidelines. And probably uh, one of the injustices in the Uganda Clinical Guidelines is that there are guidelines about almost everything and anything. Whereas the essential maternal new and newborn clinical care guidelines are really about uh, maternal and child health, um, specifically newborn health. So uh, I'll use very little time, but like you've heard from um, Moses, uh, the difference now in the definition of preeclampsia is that you might not need to have proteinuria in the presence of hypertension. And um, I think for me, the takeaway for uh, our friends at the Ministry of Health is the importance of um, equipping these uh, uh, CIMOC uh, facilities with good laboratory facilities and ultrasound uh, care because they will be important in making the diagnosis of preeclampsia in the absence of proteinuria. The second thing is um, the classification where we used to think that it's mild, moderate, severe. The understanding now is that once you have the disease, preeclampsia, the progression is on, it will not stop. Um, and that is, I think, a message we need to share with all our clinicians. So it will be preeclampsia without severe symptoms or preeclampsia with severe symptoms. Um, another important point is uh, issue about prophylaxis in antenatal clinic. I think in our guidelines, we uh, specifically uh, put out aspirin, uh, but I think we shall get more uh, information on calcium. But for now, uh, we advise uh, aspirin prophylaxis between uh, the end of the first trimester and not later than 16 weeks, uh, because when it started after 16 weeks, uh, its uh, efficacy in reducing uh, preterm births and uh, preeclampsia goes down. And you want to go with it up to... Um, 36 weeks. Uh, for those in academia, it would be important to find out uh, the effect of aspirin use on PPH among this population. The other group is uh, bed rest. I think it has come out today. Uh, formerly, we thought bed rest was uh, something to recommend. And I think in most of uh, the clinical obstetrics, uh, it's something we are phasing out as well. So it's not really recommended that we are going to tie our mothers in bed. Uh, IV fluids, I don't think anyone talked about them if we listened very well, but they were written previously. Uh, so this you will have to um, uh, consider a case in front of you, but uh, most of our patients are not hypovolemic unless maybe she has a abrupture or something uh, that is taking up her fluid. Um, in our guidelines or in these current guidelines, uh, there is new information on expectant management. Um, I think uh, Dr. Moses brought it out, but my slide is really just pointing out issues that once you have the guidelines, you want to run to and acquaint yourself with. So what are the components of the extant management, expectant management, which patients are we going to consider? You'll find that in the new guidelines and it, was, it wasn't there in the previous ones. Uh, there was talk about mild uh, preeclampsia, but not much was said in 2016, but we provide a good box about what you want to do for the mother uh, you think can have a clean monitoring from home, including blood pressure monitoring, antihypertensives and uh, fetal well-being. To sonography, uh, I think in the old guidelines, they just say do an ultrasound scan. In these current guidelines, there is breakdown of what you want to do. 
And uh, part of the things that are found might be informative uh, for clinicians on the call might be the umbilical artery Doppler studies. Um, at least uh, it will tell you about uh, the risk of uh, IUGR in intrauterine growth restriction in uh, the mother's, in the baby um, the mother is carrying. And uh, that might be one of the reasons you're going to terminate that pregnancy. Uh, as I conclude, um, we now understand that there should be emphasis on postpartum care. In the old guidelines, it uh, felt like after delivery, we are good and dusted. Uh, our understanding now and what we would want to advise is let's keep uh, our mothers in hospital for about 72 hours while we uh, continue to uh, uh, monitor the blood pressure and actually control it. Uh, we check uh, their uh, uh, organ function, uh, renal function tests specifically. And once uh, all that is well controlled and they are reverting back to normal, please consider discharge. And after discharge, you want to see the mother at one week, six weeks and 12 weeks postpartum. Um, I think my take home from this is uh, for postpartum care, uh, we, we shall have to think about long-term care for mothers who remain hypertensive and please let's link them up uh, into physician care. Thank you, Irene and friends. Uh, that's all I had to share. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Mark from Barara University for that brief presentation. Uh, colleagues, we are now moving to the fourth presenter. Uh, this is a senior midwife from Masaka Regional Referral who is giving us the details of the role of midwives the role of midwives in prevention, diagnosis, and management plus follow-up of mothers with preeclampsia. Thank you so much, Sister Sophie. Please, you can load in your presentation. Uh, Sister Sophie, just before you come in, I uh, would like to request the panelists to kindly reply to some of the questions in the Q&A box for those that can be uh, answered just by text. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good idea from Ruth. Okay, the next presenter is, she's very passionate about helping mothers to survive from all conditions around pregnancy. She's going to give us the roles of management. No, she's going to give us the role of health facility leadership and other stakeholders in ensuring quality of care to mothers with preeclampsia. Thank you. Dr. Akelo, go ahead and... Okay, thank you, Dr. Irene. I hope people are able to see. I have very few slides and I'll be a little fast. Okay. So like already said, I'm looking at the role of facility managers at different levels in the management of preeclampsia, eclampsia. And uh, as we already know, management is very core for any organization to perform successfully as it gives institutional sense of direction. So for, for us to manage preeclampsia, eclampsia, we need to know the vision and mission of the different facilities and mobilize commitment to the overall organization management. So even for preeclampsia, eclampsia management is very paramount and plays a critical role. So what are these roles? We need to give leadership and governance by having a competent and committed leadership at the facility to constantly guide the staff members on quality of care. I think we have looked at the overall score for management of preeclampsia in the national assessment, and we still know that there are issues to, to, to do with our quality of care. So leadership and governance, putting into perspective quality of care, sense of direction for the staff, and making sure that the facility has functional MPDSR committees and hold regular meetings and give appropriate feedback. And then also management looks to, needs to look into issues of human resource. I know nationally we've had this cry, we've had this song, but there are critical cadres that need to be present for us to, to, to manage uh, preclampsia, eclampsia. Uh, in their national assessment, we saw the issues of anesthesia in some facilities where health center pools are not functional. 
chronic absenteeism, so there are unnecessary referrals because uh, the skilled people are not on ground. So management really needs to address issues of human resource uh, for us to be able to manage uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia effectively. Provision of infrastructure and space, uh, like Prof already made mention, one of our green areas was um, and the uh, respectful maternity care where the preeclamptic mothers actually scored highly for having uh, privacy. And this is because most facilities we went to had a separate room for management of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So these are things that need to be brought to the attention of managers that these mothers need a quiet environment, need a companionship, which cannot be in the general world, need support. And so uh, this is very critical. Then uh, provision of medicines and supplies. You know, we do all this ordering, budgeting and uh, purchase. And uh, sometimes the managers are not very technical people in these areas that need to be guided uh, on what essential drugs we need for managing preeclampsia. We should not run out of antihypertensives. We should not run out of uh, anticonvulsants. We should not run out of monitoring tools at any one point in the facilities. Uh, provision of equipment. One of the key things that came up was uh, our laboratory equipment. I think we saw that it mainly the PNFPs that were able to do the, the investigations and facilities, including the national referral. We are not able to do basics like LFTs. So these are things we need to look into, provision of equipment, beep, simple things like BP machines, urine dip sticks in the, in the, in the labor wards and the, test, and the other test kits. And then health information, providing the HMIS tools for monitoring, for management, and uh, for all the other parameters as pertains to preeclampsia, eclampsia care. Uh, management also needs to look at coordination of various departments, such as laboratory, stores, pharmacy, outpatient, so that there is direction of flow of patients and also to elicit team spirit uh, for quality improvement. Provision of technical support supervision to the staff on a regular basis. You know, these are checkpoints to see. You may think you're performing very well until you actually go down and see what people are doing. So we have to offer the technical support at all levels of care, from the lowest unit to the most high level of care. Then uh, one of the significant things that came out in our first presentation was the lack of protocols. And this is why the PET subcommittee took it upon themselves to come up with these very detailed guidelines. And we hope that these protocols can be uh, disseminated, the flowcharts. But even as an institution, you can actually just pick out those flowcharts, print them, and have them at all service points. So these are things we need to, to work on. Have the protocols at all service points where PET is managed right from antenatal care through to postnatal ward. And then we need client or patient-centered care, making sure there is functional IPC materials, regular meetings with feedback and provision of supplies for IPC. Now that was at the level of top managers. How about the middle managers, the midwives, the, the person in the maternity, the in charge, let's say, allocation of duty, ensuring that stations are covered. Right now, most, most uh, hospitals have got HDU and preeclampsia or eclampsia rooms, should, making sure that there is somebody assigned to these duty stations. Arrangement and organization of ward departments, ordering of medicines and supplies, and having making sure that these uh, preeclampsia kits are available and fully stocked. Maintenance of, of supplies, controlling the ward, as we already noticed, these patients need privacy. Some of our facilities are too congested with the extended families coming to eat in the facility and visiting, accounting for the resources that are given to the department, coordinating the department with top management. You need somebody to keep updating top management about what is lacking. And then most importantly, team building among the departmental staffs as already observed, conflict management and resolution among the staff. Sometimes patients end up being the victims of our own conflicts as, as staff. So this is for the level middle uh, managers. Departmental supervision and ongoing CMEs in the units. You may have the hospital general CMEs, but as a maternity unit, as that labor ward unit, you need to have your CMEs and mentorship on different topics, 
you can just decide one day we are going to do just mixing magnesium sulfate, how to administer hydralazine within the unit, holding departmental meetings to assess how you're performing and give feedback. Very key as a manager at middle level. Thank you so much. Uh, I felt that is basically what we could do. Over to you, Chair. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Asher, for that brief, um, um, brief uh, communication. But what is clear here is that I think, I hope, I don't know whether we have managers attending to this webinar, but all of us, if there are no managers, we get back home and talk to the managers, especially the top management, what they should do, recruiting the right personnel who are teachable. Dr. Mugahi, I think this one should take up to the ministry and the rest of the things, BP machines are lacking and it's true, but when we need to follow up properly with the managers, because the managers don't know what we need to help these mothers. So if we bring the point and at focus properly to the managers, I'm very sure they can help us also procure some of the missing items. Uh, Dr. Irene, we are sorting out uh, the technical glitch for Sophia. We could maybe in the meantime respond to some of the questions. Okay, colleagues, we have had it clear. Let's get some of the questions. There was, I don't know, we are going to sort out the issue of questions. There was question and answer box, which has about 38. Maybe, I don't know, we go about, maybe people put up their hands and they raise questions, or we go to the ones of the box of question and answer. Uh, Sister Irene, we can help you read out a few of the questions that are in the box especially those that have not been answered yet. Would well, thank you so much, Grace. Go ahead and read them loud and clear. And then probably as you read them, we can see whom we are directing them to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one is uh, from Nakazi Safina, and it says, what is that maximum total dose for Nifedip? Your, your voice is too low, I don't know why. It's fair to be loud and clear. Okay, can you able to, can, are you able to hear me now? It has improved. Okay, now I was saying that uh, one is from Nakazi Safina and it says, what's the maximum total dose for Nifedipin? Okay, Dr. Moses Adroma, could you kindly answer that question? Okay, so we, we, we give nifedipin uh, mainly starting at uh, 20 milligrams, uh, 12 hourly, but uh, we usually don't expect you to exceed 80, 80 milligrams in a day. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, the next question is from... Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Grace, it seems like Mr. is ready. Okay, perfect. But I would also like to suggest that we can do the Q and A and answer, type in the answers and also circulate after the webinar. I've answered most of the, some of the questions there. Okay. Uh, at this time, let's go back to our fourth presenter, Sister Sophia. Sister Sophie. Thank you so much, Dr. Irene. And thank you all the previous presenters for the wonderful information you've just shared with us. My name is Sophia. I am a midwife uh, working with Basaka Regional Referral Hospital. Allow me share my screen. Uh, hello to you all. My name is Sophia Tagea, a midwife working with Masaka Regional Referral Hospital. And my presentation is on the role of midwives in the prevention, identification, and management of preeclampsia. Everything has been said almost about the eclampsia, so I'll just focus on the midwife and what we can do to ensure that we improve the outcomes of the neonates and the mothers. From the previous presentations, we do agree that preeclampsia is indeed a priority emergency obstetric condition, which has caused a lot of poor neonatal and maternal outcomes. We see prematurity and the complications that come with it, still, but uh, neonatal mortality and maternal mortality as a result of preeclampsia. And as midwives, we do have a very important role 
uh, to play in the overall management of this condition. We can do a lot to prevent it. We can do a lot to identify it early and then uh, manage it uh, and make sure that we prevent the outcomes that are not needed. So indeed, midwives uh, are very important in the sense that when we talk about uh, pregnancy and skilled care, most of the time, we are talking about a pregnant woman and a midwife. Where there is a pregnant woman, there is a midwife. Where there is a mother in labor, there is a midwife. And where there is a postnatal mother, there is a midwife. It is, uh, I don't think if it is even possible, but in Uganda, at least I know that a woman cannot be pregnant and then go to carry the pregnancy to term, deliver and go through the postpartum period when they have not been touched by a midwife. It is just not possible here. I'm quite sure about that. So midwives are usually the first people to get in contact with pregnant women and even those that are not yet pregnant. We have seen many women coming to health facilities to seek for advice on how to get pregnant and they come to midwives. So the fact that most of the time we have midwives everywhere with these mothers, we believe that there's a big, big role that we can play to make sure that we prevent lots of complications. And uh, just to emphasize the presence of midwives everywhere, we know that the lower health facilities, the primary health facilities, wherever they are, at least they are being run by midwives almost entirely. And if a mother doesn't have any complication, they will be seen through pregnancy delivery postpartum without ever getting uh, to look for a doctor. And from the referrals that we get uh, most of in, in, to most of these uh, uh, tertiary health facilities, the referrals from lower centers are being made by midwives. Referrals from health center threes are being made majorly by midwives. If uh, we just go to look at the referral rate as there is proof that midwives are mainly are the ones referring mothers. And if a pregnant woman is to see a doctor, at least they see them along midwives. So midwives are really everywhere, making them very, very important in preventing this ugly condition. Um, uh, and in order to do that really well, it is important that midwives have the right knowledge and the skills needed so that they are able to do what they should do for prevention, do what they should do in early identification and indeed in the management of the condition in case it is identified after occurring. And the goals for the management, just like Dr. Moses uh, shared them, we are looking at stabilizing the patient because of the ill health that comes with the condition, preventing or controlling convulsions in case they have occurred, ensuring that hypertension is controlled and other complications that come from the condition, and to also plan for delivery or referral in case the condition has been identified from a lower health facility. So we shall look at uh, the roles of uh, the midwife uh, before conception, during pregnancy, delivery, and also in the postpartum period of conception, uh, we see that the fact that midwives are usually everywhere in communities with uh, where these women are, where the caretakers are, where the friends and the employers are, we see that they have a very important role of educating the people about this condition. Uh, people should be knowing that there's a possibility of having this condition during pregnancy. And if they knew earlier and they know what can happen and how we can prevent it or manage it, then I believe uh, we can be placed, uh, we can place these mothers in a better uh, position uh, for them to be managed or for the condition to be prevented completely uh, so that we avoid the complications that we see coming with that. So women, intending to become pregnant should be at least know about this condition. Uh, their partners, their friends, the religious leaders, the cultural leaders, our people that we surround ourselves with should be informed of what the disease is, how we can prevent it, 
the signs and symptoms, the complications that come with it, and their role uh, in the community in trying to prevent this condition. Next slide, thank you. Uh, it is unfortunate that we don't see very many women seeking for preconception of care. And many of, uh, of the time, the mothers that come to facilities are coming because they have tried and failed. But idea, tried to conceive and failed. So they are looking for a device. But ideally, I think everyone that is ready to have a baby should be first uh, taken through or checked and prepared uh, for pregnancy. And if this is to happen, the preconceptional care, uh, it means that the midwife now has a chance to fully assess these women that are ready to become pregnant for any risk factors that we are going to see in the following slides, uh, uh, so that in case they are present, the mothers are counseled, including the people that are helping them, uh, or counseled or managed. Mm? We know that we can have preventive management in case we've identified a mother that has risk factors for hypertension. Some conditions can also be managed earlier. For example, we know that if someone has a hypertension, then they could have, it could put them at a higher risk of developing preeclampsia. So if you identify that before a mother conceives, then there's a chance that you will control the hypertension, or if it is diabetes, you control that. If it is overweight, you try to control that. And in doing that, we'll be trying to really put down the risks that make uh, preeclampsia, that put these mothers at a risk of developing the preeclampsia. So this preconceptional care is very important. And as midwives, we should appreciate that we can do a lot even before this condition develops. Uh, during pregnancy, it is the role of the midwife to, during antenatal care, to assess all pregnant women as they come for the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. So when we have uh, our knowledgeable midwives who know about these diseases or conditions that can happen because of pregnancy, as mothers come, if we are taking, uh, checking their blood pressure, we are checking them because we are trying to identify, uh, to, trying to, to, to establish the status of our mothers. And if we find that the hypertension is already there, or if we are able to diagnose actually the disease from our assessment, then we can be at a better position to manage this early and prevent complications. So blood pressure measurements must be genuinely taken on our mothers on every visit. And this is the role of midwives, since we have seen that midwives are everywhere with the mothers most of the time during pregnancy. So this proper assessment will ensure that we can do early diagnosis, consultation, and then treatment uh, for better management of the condition. Next slide, please. Another role during pregnancy for midwives is to be able to predict preeclampsia, eclampsia. And by doing this, what do I mean? Since there are no specific tests that we can carry out on pregnant women to know who will develop or not develop the condition, but at least we know that there are risk factors that put these mothers at risk, then there's a big role that we can play in, uh, in offering the preventive management to those mothers that we identify with the risks that put them at, uh, that uh, make them susceptible to developing the condition. And this will mean we are trying to prevent, uh, which I know that we can if our mothers come to us early during pregnancy and we assess them and control the hypertension. So the risk factors for midwives to assess, are there high risk factors uh, which include if a mother had early onset of preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy that ended with adverse outcomes, mothers with multiple pregnancy, chronic hypertension, diabetes, or chronic kidney disease. These are high risk factors to developing preeclampsia. Then we also have moderate risk factors. Uh, for example, someone carrying a pregnancy for the first time, a uh, mother being at 35 years of age or above, if there is a history of preeclampsia in the family where this mother is coming from, uh, obesity, 
uh, mother coming from a low socioeconomic status and then previous low birth weight. Now, as midwives, it is important that we are able to assess for these risk factors. And then when we identify who has them, we should be able to know when to start managing. For mothers that have high risk factors, the ones that we saw first, or those that have two of any moderate risk factors, these should be given preventive management, just like the previous doctor said of, of aspirin, a dose of 75 milligrams, at least once a day, starting from 11 weeks of gestation to 36 weeks of gestation. They said it is better if we start this early on eh, before 16 weeks, so between 11 and before 16 weeks, these mothers should be started on such therapy for prevention. Another role that we as midwives can do very well is diagnosing the preeclampsia early. This, uh, just like I said that most of the referrals from lower health facilities are made by midwives. And the reason is because midwives are readily there uh, and they're the ones that are receiving these mothers and assessing them. So the knowledge of what preeclampsia is, just like they took us through what it is, how it comes about, how, it, uh, how you can diagnose it. The knowledge of doing that is very important for the midwives to properly have so that as they check, the mothers, they are able to diagnose preeclampsia on time and they refer to the higher health facilities uh, so that we manage the condition early and prevent the outcomes that we saw coming from it. Then the midwives also have an important role of counseling. After diagnosing the pregnant woman with preeclampsia, uh, or the mother in the postpartum period with preeclampsia. It is important that we help these mothers understand what they have been diagnosed with, what it means, and how they need to be managed. Not only them, but including their partners and the people that give them support. Because if they don't understand this, we've seen women thinking that preeclampsia in the, the mothers in those communities down there in the villages they could have their own understanding of the condition. And we've seen mother coming in late with complications because when they were told at a certain health facility that they had preeclampsia and they went back home, they had a different understanding of the whole thing and therefore decided to seek their own management. And later here, they come in when they have already developed complications. So midwives should do a good counseling to these mothers of ours and their attendants so that they understand what needs to be done to enhance cooperation in managing this deadly condition. It is also the role of midwives to ensure that everything that is needed to manage preeclampsia is available. Midwives need to be prepared for this disease. Whoever is dealing with a pregnant woman who knows that uh, pregnant women are at risk of developing preeclampsia? Then it is important that you are prepared to manage that condition in case it comes about. So it is their role to order these supplies beforehand and have a complete preeclampsia kit uh, ready and accessible 24 7 so that as soon as diagnosis of the disease is made, then uh, management can be uh, started. Uh, early to prevent complications. I may not go through all these that are supposed to be there because I know we know, but at least at least we know we, we should have the magnesium sulfate drug, the calcium gluconate. Where there is magnesium sulfate, we should have calcium gluconate. We should have the antihypertensive. We should have uh, lignocaine. We should have diazepam. Next slide. Fentanyl. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we need uh, the oral antihypertensive, we need the misoprostoxytocin because we know we shall need to conduct delivery. We need the dexamethasone, betamethasone. But uh, just making sure that we have everything that we need to manage is the role of a midwife who deals with these mothers most of the time, who receives these mothers most of the time. Next slide. 
this is a continuation of just the contents in a PE, uh, preeclampsia kit, uh, the cannulas, the giving sets, the patella hammer, early warning core charts, so that we make sure we, we, we monitor fluid balance charts. Uh, we just need to have a complete uh, Upon the diagnosis uh, of preeclampsia or eclampsia, it is the importance or the role of a midwife to constitute management as soon as possible. Uh, for example, if a mother has been diagnosed with a condition in the lower health facilities, where our midwives know that they should refer to the CMOC facilities, at least they know that they need to administer the pre-referral treatment. Uh, we have the magnesium sulfate recommended for severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, uh, before a mother is referred. And if the diagnosis has been made uh, at a tertiary facility, it is still the same drug that the midwives there will, will give. So it is very important for midwives to know and have these drugs ready, know how to use them, so that upon diagnosis of preeclampsia, the appropriate medicine can be administered and the mother referred timely or managed properly to prevent the severe complications. Next slide. Referral, uh, just like I was saying, that in the lower health facilities, the role of the midwife will be diagnosing, giving pre referral treatment, and then referring to a CMOC facility uh, where more investigations can be done, more monitoring, more treatment, and where a plan of delivery can be made. Our referrals should be written by our midwives in the lower health facilities, indicating uh, what they did upon diagnosis of the condition so that uh, the midwives that are receiving at a tertiary facility can just continue from there. Next slide. Uh, this is just a, this was a continuation of the management that upon diagnosis, some treatments are administered, uh, then referral is made. These are just unhygienic after administering the magnesium sulfate, it is recommended that antihypertensives are administered depending on the blood pressure. One just has to know when to use hydralazine, uh, when to use methadipine, and then they refer. Then the other important role is monitoring and collaborating with other members uh, in order to prevent complications. We do monitor the mother and the fetus, and the midwife has a very key role in ensuring that monitoring is done adequately uh, in order to guide the decision on the timing of delivery. We know that diagnosis can be made anytime uh, when the pregnancy is before term or at term, but depending on uh, the staging of the disease, then it, it, the decision on when to deliver is made. Next slide. Next slide. So the monitoring, no, the previous slide, sorry, with more oh, here, we were talking about the monitoring, that it is important to guide the decision and it helps to know how the disease is progressing. For example, if we are doing expectant management where a mother is coming in weekly, then a midwife has to carry out uh, all these uh, observations to guide the decision to see how that the disease is progressing so that they can decide on whether to continue with the expectant management or to terminate pregnancy accordingly. So we said blood pressure monitoring is very important. If the mother is uh, still attending antenatal after diagnosis of preeclampsia, if it is mild and she's coming in weekly, it means that weekly we do blood pressure measurements. Weekly we assess the fetal growth. Uh, we assess the fetal movements. We teach the mother how to do the fetal it counts, we listen to the fetal heart sounds, we assess the urine protein, the tendon reflexes, and if the mother is admitted in the facility, then when the monitoring is done, changes the blood pressure. We've seen that if a mother is in the facility with severe uh, preeclampsia, then we need to do blood pressure monitoring at least four hourly. We might need to listen to the fetal heart sounds uh, hourly or to hourly, depending on that condition and how the mother is responding uh, to the management or to the treatments that are being given. And this is very important because the midwife 
is there uh, is there with the mother, for example, during admission, you have a midwife on day, you have a midwife on evening, you have a midwife on, on night duty. So it is important that this continues as it is supposed to be in order to identify any uh, issues that may need us to necessitate, the, that may necessitate uh, to decide on when to quickly terminate the pregnancy. So the midwife should be knowledgeable with what is to be investigated. You know, gone are the days when midwives were just, were just on the wards to give treatments without even understanding. Gone are the days when midwives were just there to say the mother has preeclampsia management, inform the doctor. No, the midwife should be fully knowledgeable on what happens from the right time of diagnosing preeclampsia. She should understand if they are sending the mother for investigations, which investigations are, are those? How can she interpret them? Because in the absence of a doctor, she can do a lot as the doctor comes in, because we know that this is collaborative work now. It is not just the midwife, but because she's there most of the time, then she should do what is uh, required, what she understands should be done so that she helps other team members uh, not to lose time on managing the condition. This midwife also has the important role of preparing for delivery as agreed by the caring team. This has already been talked about by Dr. Moses on when they may decide to deliver and how to deliver the mother. It is also the role of the midwife to understand what can be done to improve the quality of care in the face of preeclampsia eclampsia. and uh, the most important place for this to happen is for these midwives to attend maternal and perinatal death surveillance and reviews. Midwives need to participate when we are doing near miss audits of a mother who suffered complications uh, from preeclampsia, eclampsia. Midwives should be there. Audits should not be done by specialists, by only a few people, because now that will deny the midwives a chance of fully understanding how best they could uh, next time probably handle a mother that has preeclampsia, eclampsia in order to prevent the complications that come with that. And midwives should also take on the, ro the role of researching. They should be involved in research so that they can be able to understand how things come, come about. This helps them to appreciate the things they do. Some midwives, uh, used to be, I think, timid, timid. They do not know when you're telling them what to do, they can do, but they cannot understand. But if they involve themselves in research, then they are able to appreciate where things come from and they are able to communicate better to communities because they now have full understanding of probably where the new recommendations are coming from. When they're saying, let us manage like this, where is that coming from? That can only happen research and it is the role of us midwives to fully appreciate it and involve ourselves in it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the midwife, we earlier on said that she's everywhere where women are, where their partners are. So she has this important role of informing the community, of advocating, for the right things that should be in place, for things to happen, for, for, early for prevention, for example, to happen, for early diagnosis to be made, for management to be made. So midwives should ensure that they are updated with facts on the condition that is preeclampsia, eclampsia from time to time, so that they can share this information well with the stakeholders. We can't prevent preeclampsia or complications of preeclampsia and eclampsia alone without involving all the other members that are important in ensuring that we prevent, we identify, or we manage early. So there is that big advocacy role of this midwife in ensuring that things are available. BP machines are available when mothers come for antenatal care. Medicines, if we talked about aspirins, they should be there and it's all the role of the midwife to make sure that things happen the right way they should happen in order to improve the quality of care. Midwife as a mentor, as we get information, 
it is important that we, we, we share it with others. We share it with the fellow midwives because we don't work alone. You find uh, that in a unit where mothers are being cared for, we have midwives, we have doctors, we have students, uh, we have, yeah, I think students. So it is important that we are sharing this information with everyone we are working with. It is not okay for me to know things alone because while I'm off duty and there is this new student that has come to my unit and they do not know what to do, it means they might miss uh, the chance of quickly identifying the preeclampsia or managing, and that will lead to complications that would have been prevented if everyone in the team is as uh, updated as uh, they should be in the management of this role. And this is really, really important for midwives, then midwives as leaders, as a way to prevent or manage preeclampsia. It is important because as we get to understand uh, the new updates, then we are supposed to make sure as leaders to make sure that our fellow midwives, our fellow colleagues, the nurses, our fellow colleagues, the doctors, the students can uh, appreciate what is new. So this is the role of the leader ensure that guidelines are there, protocols are there, and they are being followed in order to prevent this condition and the complications that come with it. Next slide. Uh, the role of midwives in managing preeclampsia uh, during labor. We, we looked at before conception, we've been looking at what the midwife can do during pregnancy, now we want to see what the midwife can do during labor and preparum. And uh, almost what we've been talking about uh, applies here, apart from a few things that may change. And the first and most important thing is that as mothers uh, come uh, with complaints of labor-like pains and we are assessing them, it is very important that we, 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 are, we carry out the blood pressure measurements on every mother. I know there are units where blood pressure is not taken to mothers. I would not even want to know what happens there. But as midwives, as caring midwives who appreciate how deadly this condition is, it is important that every mother who seeks admission is assessed for preeclampsia through measuring their blood pressure and properly checking other par parameters as well. And this is the same thing as they come for postnatal care. All mothers should be assessed for blood for preeclampsia through blood pressure measurements in order to identify this disease early and manage. And after assessment, it is now uh, since we now have the knowledge as we are assessing, we know how to diagnose, we know how to stage. Then it is we do that as a role. We diagnose the preeclampsia. And then after diagnose, diagnosing, we do the counseling to help these mothers understand the condition still, because when they don't understand it, then they may not appreciate why they need to take the medicines you're giving them. And, and that will mean that probably they will fail you and probably complications that you would have prevented. So it is important that we understand what to talk about. And if you are, in a, a lower health facility where you have made the diagnosis from, cancel the mother and give free referral treatment, write a referral, and then refer the mother to a CIMOC facility where more comprehensive care can be given. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the midwives uh, have to continue monitoring both the fetal and maternal condition during labor. After making the diagnosis, we know the medicines we give for, for preventing convulsions or controlling. Sophia, Sophia yes. we need to wrap up in the next two minutes. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm, I'm, almost done. I'm almost done. So it is important that the midwife does the monitoring, just like I said in the antenatal period. This time around, mother has come in labor, so the frequency of monitoring changes and then to prepare for delivery depending on the stage, uh, to do the postnatal check, uh, checkups in case we are in the postpartum period, and then to also uh, participate in death reviews, to participate in research, in communication with other members, uh, to understand the condition and to 
carry out our leadership roles well in order for it to prevent the com complications that come from it. Next slide, that could be the last, I think. So in conclusion, we see that uh, preeclampsia is a deadly condition. We know that it is specific to pregnancy and we know that it causes poor maternal and fetal outcomes. And though the cause is unclear, at least we know that there are risk factors that can help a midwife diagnose. Early identification and proper management can prevent the severe morbidity and mortality that comes with it. And so a midwife being everywhere with these mothers is at the very center stage for its prevention, diagnosis, and management. Next slide. So I end by saying that life is a beautiful, precious treasure anyone could ever, anyone could ever have. As our mothers come to us, we need to make sure we prevent complications and preserve their lives. We need to make sure that these babies they are trying to give life uh, indeed get the life and enjoy the goods that come from it, and that together we can end the preventable maternal and neonatal mortality. Thank you so much for listening to me. Okay, thank you so much. I was saying, I was thanking Sophie for the elaborate presentation on the work of midwives in preventing or reducing death from preeclampsia. And I was saying, if the government was to allow, to be precise, you've seen the work the midwives do in our hospitals. It would be fair, actually, if they paid them slightly higher than nurses, because they really do a lot. That is my thought. <laughs> But uh, back to, we finished the presentation from all the five panelists. Again, my name is Dr. Chebet Irene. Somebody was calling me sister. I work in Sorotu Regional Referral as a medical officer, special grade ops and gain. Thank you so much from Professor Nachumuli up to Sophie for all your presentations. Now we go to, our time is almost up, but let's add in maybe more 20 minutes for answers, I'm aware. Under the box of question and answer, they have answered most of the questions. Unless there are some questions pending, maybe we could pick a few and we answer, then we call it a day. Thank you. Dr. Irene, I suggest that for purposes of time, we have shot beyond uh, the required time, we're supposed to finish at 4 p.m. But if the team, this is a great learning event, we can use five to 10 minutes and just receive questions. Yeah people can ask questions. Uh, they've answered all the ones in the chat. We can just put some hands. I okay, don't know if you can you. see the people who have raised their hands. I'm seeing Akelo Jacqueline only. I'm not seeing Okay, others. there is Masi Mwanja. Okay, uh, I was suggesting there are some questions which are relating to the guidelines. And I was asking the team to be patient because what Adroma presented is just the flow chart. But there is a bigger section of the guidelines, which is the narrative, which talks about all these risk factors and the preventive measures, when to give the aspirin, when to stop, when to do what. So if people can just wait when we share the guidelines, they'll be able to pick up some of those things. Maybe we can answer the questions pertaining to the findings of the national survey where people need clarification. I don't know. Thank you. So, okay, so okay, we've I, allowed... think that's a, I was saying that's a good idea because we are giving ourselves additional five minutes, but I've seen there are about eight hands up. Richard, what how do we go about? Let's let's pick some questions from uh, the hands. And as a few. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very grateful presentations that have been made here, right from Professor to Sophie. Sophie, uh, kudos, you have done a very good job. I think the midwives here on the platform and others are very proud. Now, my question is only direct to Professor about um, the, the findings, most especially around uh, postnatal care and also postnatal contacts where the, the, the findings were quite low. And yet uh, we are looking at uh, uh, regional comparisons. I thought I uh, would have some bit of comparisons of the regions and see which region is doing well on this. This one is doing 
badly in terms of performance, because that would be very good instead of just using um, the, the, the hospitals. Then uh, I think also secondary analysis of this data would also give us a better picture in terms of uh, those uh, specifics. And then uh, my also other concern is, uh, did we look at uh, any differences between the normal population and also people population of concern, the refugees most especially? Uh, were there those comparisons in, uh, in, in the analysis so that we are able to, to, to have uh, this uh, uh, kind of findings uh, more focused in terms of uh, responding to those areas that are not really doing good. I submit. Thank you so much, Michael, for your questions. Maybe we pick more other questions and then they answer at once and we close. Richard Kajimu, could you take lead in the next questions? Uh, whoever is ready to ask, please go ahead and unmute. We'll allow two more and close this. Yes, uh, thank you so okay. much. Uh, this is... Josephine first. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for those very wonderful presentations, right from uh, the presentation from the professor up to uh, um, Sister Sophie. Mine goes to the professor, actually. Um, currently, the country is grappling with respect to maternity care, and really the score of performance actually took me by surprise when you talked about respectful maternity scoring at 87%. So I'd have loved to hear more on exactly what was scored, right from when you look at the MNHQRC standards of four, effective communication with our clients, emotional support, um, provision of care with respect and dignity. So I really would have loved to hear more on what was scored, especially so at the high volume facilities, how that score came about. Thank you very much. Perhaps there could be more learnings from that that we can scale up. Thank you very much. Over to you. Okay. One more person. Harriet, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, much applaud to the presenters. Uh, much as Dr. Jackie uh, said, uh, we, we keep never questions, uh, especially on the, on the management. But uh, I, I was a little confused uh, during Moses' presentation, especially, uh, especially the, the bit of um, keeping the mothers of uh, uh, the ones at 34, 35, 36 weeks. And, and yet actually my assumption was, all oh, books do say, it's the baby that's causing this uh, rise in pressure. Uh, my observation is the facilities had been moving for the maternal reviews following uh, death due to preeclampsia is that uh, some of these mothers uh, were detected early and were still being kept and uh, this guy is being monitored and then uh, they slowly progress from pre to actual eclampsia and finally they die. Uh, I felt it contradicting from what I knew before that actually irrespective of the gestation, the pregnancy, the, the pregnancy should be terminated. I, I got a little confused and uh, uh, I'm still to see the guideline uh, Dr. Jackie has talked about, or maybe more clarification if Jackie can still throw more light. Uh, I got more confused. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you. Harriet. So yes. we'll respond to those for now and uh, see how to move there. Over to you, Irene and uh, Prof. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. I, there are still more questions, but then I think we had given ourselves five minutes. Maybe we, we, we now go to Professor Nachimuli and Dr. Kelo to answer those questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you colleagues for those questions and chair. Uh, I, I will have to be quick. Uh, Jackie, please prepare to answer the issue of respectful maternity care, but uh, I'll start with the others. Uh, thank you, was it Chivule, Michael, for that uh, observation about the, the poor performance, especially in regard to the postpartum 
care. This was generally very low, as I pointed out. But also I wanted to add that actually you're right, we are continuing to do further analysis on this data to see those trends, the regional trends, uh, the issues of those populations of concern, the refugees, those facilities where the care is provided. So as we get on in other disseminations, we shall actually give a bit of more information, but for now we, we were really more concerned about the general outlook but also we needed the general outlook to really work on the guidelines so that they could get ready. But what we know is actually some of the things didn't have much regional variation, uh, but I think it will be good when I can really show you nicely with the, with the, with the trends. And uh, the other issue, and I thank you for that observation. Yeah, more analysis will happen. Uh, Jackie, are you ready to talk about how we really, I think that was Dr. Josephine, uh, who asked about the right, the surprisingly high respectful maternity care that we recorded. Uh, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Professor. I think why, um, so what, it was really a bundle of all the components of respectful maternity care. We didn't really highlight each. And we also have to observe that this uh, particular assessment was observational. And um, we, we were not really asking interview patients, except for certain cases where we tried to get from the patient's perspective. And I think why we had these results is, as we already noted, most facilities, act and actually the high volume facilities, that is the general hospitals and the national referrals and regional referrals have separate kind of designated areas or rooms for management of preeclampsia, eclampsia. So most patients felt like they were given special attention in terms of management for preeclampsia, eclampsia. And, and that somehow translated into having better care compared to the general pool. And I think that is why our results uh, scored somehow high for respectful maternity care. It may not encompass all the parameters like uh, emotional support, but we also acknowledge that usually you have one or two patients who are actually allowed to have their attendants with them uh, compared to the general world where the attendants are chest out. So they feel they have some kind of special attention given to them because of the separate rooms give, uh, designated for management of peer cancer. And we really appreciate this effort. Um, somebody raised a question about regional variations. And uh, we also, we, we need to acknowledge that we first of all captured all the 14 regional referrals plus the two general hospitals that supply these uh, regional referrals and a health center four and a three. So we had wide coverage per region, at least five facilities per region. But what, what stood out is um, like Prof had already alluded to is that some regions are actually having preeclampsia as their number one cause of maternal mortality. And this strongly stood out from Bali region. I think it was also discussed in one of the MPGSR um, committee meetings, the weekly Thursday meetings where they presented their statistics. And uh, we are yet to do the regional variations and, and have it disseminated, but Mbale specifically stood out. And I think Kampala, especially the two national referrals, PPH and PET are actually competing. And sometimes you will find, I think there's a, then PET is actually lead as a cause of maternal mortality. Uh, to answer Harriet uh, on the guideline, I, I got the key word was, um, we are keeping these mothers in the pretext of doing the investigation and then they end up with poor outcomes. And that is why the guideline is very clear. Um, if, if you remember Droma's presentation, in the severe category, initially we have the two arms, um, PET without, without severe features and PET with the severe features. Now on the side where you have PET with severe features. And then you stabilize and you're able to follow the management protocol, do the daily labs. Now the challenge why we are having those bad outcomes is because we are pretending to be monitoring these patients yet we don't have the capability to do the daily labs, the daily ultrasound scan, and then we end up with the poor outcomes. But actually there's guideline and room for expectant management. Once the patient comes with one severe feature like high blood pressure above 160, and you've managed to successfully control the blood pressure between 34 weeks to less than 37 weeks. 
But the guideline is very clear. Any mother at 37 weeks, irrespective of uh, whether severe or not, you should deliver. But between 34, there's room for expectant management, as long as you can meet the criteria for surveillance. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Irene. Thank you so much, Dr. Akelo. And on top of what you have said to, doc, to Dr. I hope Harriet Achiro, what is key is the law facilities don't know this because we are saying we also want the mother and the baby to survive. So if it's not yet 34 weeks, but the parameters, the liver enzymes are okay, the kidneys are working well, the platelets are okay, the biophysical profile and the fetal well being is okay, and the BP is controlled, there is no hurry for you to to terminate, but you should be able to review your mother every day. So if you think that the parameters are now changing, that is when you should end the pregnancy, irrespective of the gestational age. So it's not the other way around that, we, but if everything is normal, continue monitoring that mother until 37 weeks. Immediately she gets to 37 weeks, end the pregnancy. The method is vaginal by inducing and there's contraindicated. What is key colleagues is that most law facilities, they do not know this management. So it's upon us, especially the frontline staff, regional referrals, to move to all the high volume health centers for within your region or general hospitals and have a proper CME. I'm happy Josephine Napukera is here. I think Chepaiko has one of the best training materials. If we could have a few champions in regional referrals to move to all the health centers for and general hospitals, I'm very sure we shall reduce this mortality due to preeclampsia. Uh, thank you so much. Back to Richard Kajimu. We should be able to conclude unless there's a burning question from someone. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Chabet. I think we'll close it here. Uh, I don't know if our prof had any wrap up remarks. Well, thank you. I think Richard really thanking members for attending uh, very well this webinar, especially those who have stayed up to the very end. Maybe to apologize that probably the time management could have been better, but I think there is always a lot to talk about, such a, a deadly problem. But we just want to tell them that we shall be communicating continuous disseminations, uh, sometimes giving out small bits of what we have presented in these two, hour, two and a half hours. So they them not feel like this is the end for some time. That's what we are going to plan next year and we shall disseminate uh, as widely as we've done. Otherwise, thank you and to the presenters and the chair. I think it's been wonderful. I think as you can see, this is just the beginning of our war to get rid of preeclampsia. It's a big war, but we need everybody, the midwives, the doctors, the support staff, advocates, so that we have the, the drugs available, funders, everybody is going to be important in this war. So, I'm just happy that this is discussion is happening uh, and we shall continue discussing preeclampsia until we are happy that mothers and babies are surviving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I'll now ask Dr. Ruth Chris uh, to give us some um, administrative remarks on behalf of NASMEC. Dr. Chris? You sound far, we can't hear you. Yes, I am on. Oh, really? Okay, uh, is this better? Okay, it could be a bit louder. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Kajimu. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kajimu and uh, Dr. Shebet and the team for taking the lead on this uh, webinar. We appreciate your uh, your guidance and all the knowledge that you've imparted on all the health workers of Uganda. And I would like also uh, thank very much our attendees who have been so patient up to this time. We've gone so overboard over 45 minutes uh, past the time of ending the webinar. But we'd like to thank you very much for your active participation. And I uh, do promise that we shall indeed uh, email the presentations once approved by the presenters and also be able to upload them on uh, the NASMEC YouTube channels so that you can be able to access them. Uh, we also continue to uh, encourage you to engage on the social media pages. We still have our consultants who are able to reply to some of the questions. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we may end the webinar. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you, Tim. Bye.